Let's say you've got a mass connected to a spring and the mass is sitting on a frictionless surface. If the mass is sitting at a point where the spring is just at the spring's natural length, the mass isn't going to go anywhere because when the spring is at its natural length, it is content with its place in the universe. It neither pushes nor pulls. It has no spring energy. This is like me most days in the summer. So we call this point where the spring neither pushes nor pulls the spring's natural length. And for a mass on a horizontal spring, this is going to be also the equilibrium position. And what we mean by equilibrium position is the point where the net force on the mass is zero. So for a mass on a horizontal spring, the equilibrium position is at the point where the spring is at its natural length because the spring wouldn't be pushing to the right or the left. And if you just put the mass there at that point, it would just stay there forever at rest. That'd be boring. So let's say we pull the mass to the right, a distance d. If we do this, we give this spring spring potential energy. And if we release the mass from rest while this spring has spring potential energy, the spring's going to pull the mass back to the left, and that mass is going to move through the equilibrium position with some speed. And we can figure out what that speed is just by using conservation of energy, and it's not that hard. The potential energy the spring would start with would be one half k, the spring constant, times d, the amount the spring's been stretched, squared, and there'd be no kinetic energy to start because we released the mass from rest. And as this mass flies to the left, it would start gaining kinetic energy. The spring energy would start turning into kinetic energy, and when the mass gets to the equilibrium position, the d would be zero, so at that point there'd be no spring energy, and all of this spring energy will have turned into kinetic energy. And you get this simple relationship that says all the spring energy equals all the kinetic energy at the equilibrium position. So if we solve for v, we can get that the v of this mass at the equilibrium position would be the square root of k over m times d squared. You could pull this d out because it's d squared and a square root, but this is the idea. This is the speed you would get of the mass passing through the equilibrium position. Let me ask you this. What if it was a vertical spring and this mass is sitting here? We come find a vertical spring with a mass hanging on it and we're like, hey, I want to pull this down a distance d. If I pull it down a distance d, when this mass reaches the equilibrium position again, will it also be going root k over m times d squared? Or will it be going at some different speed because now it's hanging vertically? Well, it turns out the spring constant's the same, and you pulled it down from the point where the mass is hanging. This exact same procedure is going to hold over here, and you can find the speed in the exact same way. And that should be surprising. That should not be obvious, because when the mass is hanging over here, you don't just have a spring force, you've got a gravitational force. And you don't just have spring energy and kinetic energy. Think about it. This mass is moving up and down. You've got changes in gravitational potential energy. So why don't we have to take into account the gravitational potential energy when we're doing conservation of energy in this equation? Well, that's what I want to prove to you in the rest of this video. If all you wanted was the result, if, all you, if you're good, if you're like, man, all right, I can do the same thing in both cases, don't even tell me anything else, you're good. But I suggest you watch the rest of it because knowing why you can ignore the MGH in this calculation gives you better insight into what we really mean by this D and this H and this V, as well as what we really mean by the equilibrium position, and that will conceptually aid you if you get a problem that's more challenging. So let's prove this and figure out why we can get away with ignoring this MGH right here. So I'm gonna get rid of all this. Let's start fresh. Let's just say we had a spring hanging from the ceiling of spring constant K. And let's say this spring is light. If it was heavy, it might pull itself down by its own weight. So I'm gonna assume this is a very light spring and it's hanging right here. There's no mass connected to it initially. So it's just hanging at its natural length. It's, not, it's neither pulling up nor pushing down as you see it right here because it's at its natural length but we connect a mass m to it. And when we do that, we lower the mass with our hand. We don't just let it fall and start oscillating. We first lower the mass, we connect it and lower it. We find the point where the mass is just gonna stay at rest. That would be the new equilibrium position. So this right here is essentially our new equilibrium position. In other words, that's the point where the net force on the mass would be zero. But this time, that's not at the spring's natural length, the way it was in the horizontal spring. This time, the equilibrium position is displaced the distance a away from the spring's natural length because right now, it's battling the force of gravity. In other words, the spring force exerted upward kx minus the gravitational force, which is m times g, 
has got to equal zero in order for this mass to be in equilibrium. So we can actually figure out what this distance a would have to be in terms of given variables. Since at the equilibrium position, x, the distance the spring has been stretched, is just going to have to equal mg divided by the spring constant k. This is what a is going to equal. So the distance the mass hangs down at the equilibrium position from the natural length of the spring is just going to be mg over k. This is a in this diagram. And this is going to be key, so we're going to hold on to this result right here. But let's do this. Let's ask if we take this mass and pull it down an extra amount b from the new equilibrium position, well at that point the forces won't be equal. This spring's gonna be stretched extra. It's gonna be pulling up with more force than the force of gravity. So this mass is gonna accelerate upward. It's gonna reach this equilibrium position with some speed. It's gonna shoot past that. Now the spring force is less than the force of gravity and so gravity wins in that case and it keeps going back and forth. And we can ask ourselves the same question we did before. If we pull this down a distance b, what is the speed of the mass when it passes through the equilibrium position? And again, we're gonna use conservation of energy to answer this, so we're gonna say that the initial energy in our system is gonna equal the final energy in our system. We're gonna choose two points. Let's choose initially this point down here. We release the mass from rest when it's pulled down a distance b below the new equilibrium position. And then our final point is gonna be right here at the equilibrium position, because that's where we wanna know the speed of the mass. So let's try to figure out how much energy there is in the system initially, if I pull this mass down and let it go. Well, initially, if I'm just letting this mass go, the mass is starting from rest. If the mass starts from rest, it's got no speed, and if it's got no speed, it's got no kinetic energy. So there's no kinetic energy to start with if this mass is starting from rest, but there is gonna be spring potential energy, and there's gonna be a lot of spring potential energy, because think about it, not only is this mass stretching the spring past the new equilibrium position by an amount b, but the new equilibrium position itself is stretched from the spring's natural length, A. And in this formula, when you have one half the spring constant times the length the spring has been stretched, that's the total amount the spring's been stretched. So the total amount the spring has been stretched from its natural length is gonna be A plus B. And I've gotta square that whole term. This is how much spring potential energy there's gonna be in the system initially. So how much gravitational potential energy are we gonna start with? Well, that's kind of up to us because you can always choose where you want your H equals zero reference line to be. In other words, I'm gonna choose this lowest point here because that's often convenient. I'm gonna choose this to be the H equals zero reference line. We'll measure all heights from that point. And this is allowed because it's only really differences in gravitational potential energy that matter. So you can do this. You just have to be consistent with your choice. But with that choice where this is H equals zero, the height, my mass has at the initial position is going to be zero. So that means the gravitational potential energy, which is given by mgh, is also going to be zero at that initial point. So in terms of initial energies, this is all I've got. This is my total initial energy, just the energy from the spring. And now we can set that equal to our final energies. So are we going to have any spring potential energy here at our final position? You might think no, because the final position is at the new equilibrium position. But remember, this new equilibrium position is still displaced from the spring's natural length. So I am, I'm gonna have one half K times the amount the spring has been stretched from its natural position. And at this new equilibrium position, the amount it's been stretched is just A. So I'm gonna write A here, cause that's how far the spring is stretched at this new equilibrium position. And I have to square that cause it's one half K X squared. And we're gonna have kinetic energy. This mass is gonna gain speed as it flies upward and it's gonna be moving with some speed when it gets up to that point. So the kinetic energy is gonna be one half times the mass times the speed the mass has at the equilibrium position squared. That's what we wanna determine. But there's also gonna be gravitational potential energy. We said H is zero down here. So if the mass is not there, it's gonna have potential energy due to gravity. And if it's B above this point, look at it, we pulled it down B. So when it gets back to the equilibrium position, if this is H equals zero, that's gonna be H equals B above where it started. So I have to put in M times G times the B value, this length right here. Since in moving up this mass gained MG times B of gravitational potential energy. So how do we make progress here? I wanna solve for the speed V but I've got this mess over here. Look at, I've got A plus B squared. So I better handle that first. So let's say we do the one half K and then we square this out. Remember we do FOIL. So it's first, outer, inner, last. 
I'm going to get a quantity of a squared, and then this cross term, I'm going to get plus 2 times a times b, and then plus b squared. That's what happens if I square this whole term right here. And this is starting to look really bad, but don't despair. Something, something great, something wonderful is about to happen, because I'm going to set this equal to the right-hand side. So if we multiply out on the left-hand side, we're going to get 1 half times k times a squared plus a 1 half times k times this 2ab term, plus, I'm going to get another one, 1 half k, times this b squared term, and we can say that that's supposed to equal everything on the right hand side, so we can already see some things that we can cancel. I've got a 1 half k a squared on each side, so if we subtract that from both sides, I can get rid of that, and this 1 half here is going to cancel this 2, and I'm left with kab on the left hand side plus one half kb squared. But what is ka? If you're clever and you look up here, you're like, wait a minute. I remember what ka was. k times a, if we just multiply both sides by k here, has got to equal mg because that was just the statement of equilibrium that at the equilibrium position, k times a has to equal m times g. So I could replace k times a over on this left hand side with m times g and you might be like why would I ever want to do that? Why do I want to replace k times a and I still multiply by this b? Why would I replace ka with mg? Because now that term is going to cancel with the other mgb on the other side of this equation. 1 half mv squared plus mgb but I've got mgb on the left and mgb on the right now, that's why I replaced this ka with mg. I can subtract that from both sides and magically, I just get the exact same relationship we had for the horizontal spring measured from the new equilibrium position. And this is important, so let me restate this. You can either, when solving these vertical spring problems, measure your spring displacement from the natural unstretched length of the spring, like we did right here, we had to add a plus b, because that was the distance from the natural unstretched length of the spring all the way to where the mass was. You can do that and include gravitational potential energy and get the right answer, but what we just saw is that these terms always cancel, so the alternative is that you can just measure the spring extension, the spring displacement from the new equilibrium position. And if you do that, you just leave off all mention of gravitational potential energy and you'll get the same answer. You can think of gravity simply as shifting the equilibrium position down a bit and then the mass and spring behaving just as they would on a horizontal surface as long as you only think about spring displacements from that new equilibrium position. So in other words, if you were given a problem, let me get rid of all of this. If you were just given a problem and you were told a three kilogram mass is hanging from a vertical spring of spring constant 50 newtons per meter, and this line here represents the equilibrium position, it's just hanging out right there at rest, you pull this mass down from the point where it was hanging at rest, 0.3 meters and let go, and you want to figure out what speed will it be going when it reaches equilibrium position, you can just do this. You can say, all right, down here it's got spring potential energy, 1 half K is 50 newtons per meter, times the amount the spring has been stretched, but I'm just going to consider stretches from the new equilibrium position, so I'm just going to do 0.3. I'm not going to worry about the fact that the spring has actually already been stretched to get to this equilibrium position, I'm just going to put this stretching from equilibrium. I'm going to set that equal to the kinetic energy the mass has at the equilibrium position. And we know that m, that m is 3 kilograms times v squared. And I'm not going to include information about the gravitational potential energy at all because I only measured the displacements from the new equilibrium position. So at this point, I can just solve for my V. And if you solve that algebraically for V, you cancel out the twos. You divide both sides by three and take a square root. You get that the speed of the mass at equilibrium is going to be 1.2 meters per second. So to recap, even though it seems initially like vertical springs would be much harder than horizontal springs because you've got gravitational forces and gravitational potential energy to worry about, if you measure the spring displacement from the new equilibrium position as opposed to the natural spring length, you can simply use conservation of energy without mention of gravitational potential energy at all.